Well, guys, it is a joy to be with you this morning. Always a joy to be at New Holland Baptist Church and always a joy to bring you greetings from your sister churches that make up the Chattahoochee Baptist Association all across this part of the state. Uh, New Holland's been a part of that organization for a long time, and I thank God for that. And thank God for the chance we have to partner together in reaching this region with the gospel. Let me ask you this morning to open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, way toward the end of your New Testament. Just kind of hold your finger there in the third chapter, and we will look into that third chapter in just a few minutes. Let me start out, though, with a story. Uh, This is a true story. It took place back last summer, summer of 2020, in the Chicago area. There's a fellow named Juan Elias Riesco, who's a restaurant owner. Uh, He owned a restaurant called Nini's Deli. It had been started years before by his parents who'd come to this country as immigrants, and they'd opened a little grocery store and done a whole lot of things right, and as a part of that grocery store, they had on the side a little uh, delicatessen. Apparently, they did a lot of things right in the delicatessen as well, because that business began to grow until finally it eclipsed the grocery part of the business, and and Nini's Deli became a five-star restaurant in Chicago. I mean, they were successful on every level you could think of. They had corporate partnerships with Nike and Adidas and all this kind of stuff. And they were written up in all kind of publications. So everything was going great until last summer, about the time the country erupted after the death of George Floyd. And when that happened, one of the local organizations in Chicago there demanded that, that uh, Mr. Juan Elias Riesco support their cause. That is, that he be supportive on his website, that he you know, basically not necessarily give them money, but encourage other people to give them money. And because of his convictions, he didn't think that was right. And when he refused to do that, they threatened to burn down his house. And they threatened to kill his family. They threatened to burn down his church. Long story short, it wasn't long before the business was ruined. I don't tell that story this morning because I want to be political about anything. I, I, I tell that story because it's a snapshot of the kind of a world we live in now. Like it or not, we are divided, it seems like, on just about every level you can think of. So as a nation, we're divided on issues like race or maybe law enforcement or maybe politics. We've always been divided about politics, but nowadays... Would you all agree with me that it seems like that folks are just quicker to become bitter and angry and hateful? I've seen us as a nation divided in a lot of different ways, but I don't know that I've seen us divided more than we're divided right now. True on a national level, it's true on a more local level. So, like in our local community, and even in our church communities, maybe not this one, but I could take it to some churches that are very much divided over what they've had to do the past year and all the decisions they've had to make about, do we meet or do we not meet? Do we wear a mask or do we not wear a mask? Nowadays, do we get the shot or do we not get the shot? We're just divided. What's true in local communities and church communities maybe even closer to home for you. Now, I imagine there's some folks watching online today and Maybe some folks in the house. Because these issues that divide us at these, all these different levels, the different generations don't see them the same way. So maybe at your house, maybe around your dinner table, there are discussions that become quickly angry and hateful, and your family's divided. And you're asking a question, how do I live in the midst of all of this? Much less, how do I live in the midst of a community that's divided, maybe a church community that's divided, or a nation that's divided. How do God's people deal with that? That's what I want to talk about this morning in terms of how do we live in the midst of conflict? Now in this third chapter of the book of 1 John, John is telling us the whole chapter. We won't take time to read the whole chapter today. We're just going to focus on verses 11 through 19. But if you read the whole chapter... John is giving us a picture of the family likeness or or the defining characteristics of God's children. You ever been in a restaurant someplace where you look across the way and you say to yourself, you know, I I don't know that guy, but just looking at the shape of his nose, I mean, that has got to be somebody from the Russell family. 
Oh, well, that's got to be somebody. Look how tall they are. That's got to be somebody, you know, from this family. or that. I don't know that person, but I can see the family likeness. Y'all ever had that happen? We all understand that. Well, John is telling us there's a family likeness in the children, among the children of God. You can see it as he starts out in the first verse. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. And he proceeds from there to talk about two different things that are part of the family likeness for God's children. Now, one of those things is that among God's children... God's children do not embrace a sinful lifestyle. We all are tempted to sin. We all stumble sometimes and sin. But he says, if you're one of God's children, you do not embrace a sinful, all the time, lifestyle. And the second thing he says, if you're one of God's children, you love the people around you. Those two things. He sums it up in the 10th verse. It's kind of a hinge. Between these two things, he says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. This morning, I want to take time to talk about just that second characteristic, that second part of the family likeness. There are three questions I want to talk about. One is, why is it for me so hard to love people who disagree with me. (laughs) Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult to love people who who don't love me or who see me as the enemy? Because it is hard. I hope it's not for you, but I'll just tell you, there are a lot of days it's hard for me. I'm tempted to become angry. I'm tempted to become resentful. I'm tempted to hold grudges. I'm tempted to be unforgiving. All those things. Why is this so hard? Second question is, what does it look like? What John's talking about here that is part of the family likeness for God's kids, God's children, what does it look like when it's becoming a part of my life? And lastly, what does it mean? When I can look in my life and see that love for my brothers and my sisters is becoming my normal behavior, my normal pattern of life, what does that mean in my life? Have you ever wondered... What's different about God's children in the world? Today is a good day. A good day for you to listen to the Word of God. If you've ever wondered, how do I know that I'm one of God's children? Or, or say it another way, because some folks would say, how do I know that I'm saved? And there are a lot of people who ask that question. You may be asking it if you're watching online today. A lot of folks ask that, how do, how do I know that I'm one of God's children? Today is a good day for you to listen to this chapter in the Word of God. Or you may just be like me, asking the question, you know, how, what in the world is God calling me to do in the face of the divisions in my family or divisions in my work or divisions at my school or in my neighborhood? What in the world is God asking me to do with that? Today's a good day. So let's go to the first of these questions and just ask any. Why is it, when it comes to folks around me at my school, my neighborhood, or maybe even my family, why is it so hard to love, especially when they don't love me? You know, if you know somebody that has COVID-19 or had COVID-19, maybe you had COVID-19 sometime in the last year, all of us can pretty well guarantee you know that the reason you got COVID-19 or your friend got COVID-19 was not because of their genetics. I mean, it wasn't something that was natural to them. It's not like some diseases like maybe diabetes or breast cancer where we're pre-wired to get it. I mean, it's, it's in our DNA that we're likely to get it. it. It's just not like that. It doesn't arise. COVID-19, if you get COVID-19, it doesn't come from inside you. It has to come from outside you. Isn't that right? I mean, it's not a factor of your genetics. You have to catch it from someone else. It's it's not something that's natural. It arises from inside of you. It's unnatural. That is, it comes from outside of you. And so John, in this first part of the passage we're going to read today, or we're looking at today, is implying to us and saying there's some things in in the human life, in the human world, in all of us, that are natural. 
They arise from inside of us. And love is not one of them. He alludes to this. If you, if you look in the, in the 11th and 12th verses, listen to what he says. He says, For this is a message you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. He said, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Let me stop there. Everybody here probably remembers this story from the Old Testament. It's in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Y'all remember this? This is a story of the very first murder in the Bible. And the first murder in the Bible took place in the first family in the Bible. It's almost as if John is saying, see, this has been the way it's been from the very beginning. It's always been the case. It always will be the case that what arises from inside of us and is natural to us is something other than loving our brothers. And so the Bible says, y'all remember that story? That Abel was a keeper of sheep. And Cain, he worked the ground. He was a farmer. And, And the day came that both Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord. Abel from the flocks, and and then Cain from the fruits of the ground. And and the Scripture says that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Can't y'all just kind of see the wheels turning in Cain's head? And we've all been in that spot where we feel like that what we brought was not good enough. and Somebody else was favored over us. Can't you just see the wheels turning in his head when he he thinks to himself, you know, I've been snubbed. I've been disrespected. I've been kicked to the curb. You ever felt that way? This temptation to resentment just rises up inside of you. If he had been saying it in our day and time, you might have said something like, you know, my rights have been disrespected. You ever notice how many of the Conflicts in our day and time revolve around this issue of somebody's rights being disrespected. So there's like the right to free speech, or civil rights, or marriage rights, or voting rights, or gender rights, or gun rights, or property rights, or water rights, and we could go on and on. Because this is what is normal in the world. For people to be offended for people to be resentful, for people to become angry when their rights are not respected or they are not respected. It's what's normal in the world. I mean, it doesn't have to be my rights being disrespected if I'm just inconvenienced. I don't know about you, but this is what happens to me. If I get on 985 and somebody pulls in front of me and they're going 25 miles an hour, everybody in this room understands that I want to kill that guy who's in front of me going 25. Everybody, we all feel the same thing. And if you're riding with me one day and I manage to pull that guy over and I stomp up to his front window, you're not expecting me to pull out my wallet and give him a $100 bill. (laughs) You're expecting me probably to give him a piece of my mind. And if I am, if you're riding with me one day, you see me do that, and I do reach in my wallet and give him a $100 bill, let me tell you, that is not coming from inside of me. That's coming from somewhere else. Not what's natural to me. You know, I think about that passage in Acts, I think it's the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, where the Bible says Peter and John have been preaching the resurrection in the temple, and they are arrested and hauled in front of the Sadducees, same group of people that had Jesus crucified. They want to intimidate them to shut up, and Peter and John will not shut up. They refuse to stop preaching the resurrection no matter what it costs them. And you remember that passage where the Scripture says that when these elders, these these rulers of Israel saw the boldness of Peter and John and recognized that they were just uneducated guys, just normal people, so they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I mean, almost just to say, you know, that could not have come from inside of them. That had to come from someplace else. You know, this temptation that you feel when someone pulls out in front of you going 25 miles an hour, or anytime you're inconvenienced or disrespected, someone won't listen, we all get it. We all get it. I get it. 
because it's human nature. It's just not God's nature. And the longer I'm a child of God, the more my life should reflect God's nature. Which is why John has so much to say about This is a characteristic of the family of God. This is the family likeness. That we love the people around us. Even if it's not normal. Even if other people don't do it. Even if we can come up with a hundred excuses why we shouldn't have to do it. It's one of the characteristics of the family of God. Say, why is it hard? It's because it's not natural. It has to come from outside of us. And the second question this morning is, what does it look like? When I'm beginning to do what John talks about here, to love the people around me, what does that look like? I have a friend down in Decatur, lives down in Decatur, pastors a church down there. He's just a few years younger than me. Grew up in Franklin, North Carolina back in the early 60s. It's a period of life when he, he loves to tell a story about his family going for drives in the country. And he, he grew up in a, in a time, a period, when not every car had air conditioning. Anybody here in the room can remember a time when not every car had air conditioning? All right, I can. All right, so if you're in a car that does not have air conditioning, this is his four brothers and sisters and him, <clears throat> his mom and dad, taking a drive out in the North Carolina countryside on a hot August day. You know, what do you do? You roll down the windows. If you're driving around, you got your windows rolled down, it's a matter of time. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen. One of these days, you're going to have a bee that flies into your car. So he loves to tell this story about how he was in the back seat with his four brothers and sisters. They're driving through the countryside in the summer day, and the, a bee comes into the car. And you can imagine what goes on. It's pandemonium in the back seat. I mean, they're screaming, they're crawling all over each other trying to get away from the bee. Some of them are swatting at that bee and making him matter. You can just picture it. And that went on for a couple of minutes. And finally, Dave's dad pulled the car over. I don't know if he did this because he was trying to protect them or just trying to shut them up. I don't know, but he pulled the car over. He reached over that back seat with his bare hand and he grabbed that live bee threw it out the window. Say, what does love look like? It looks like that. The willingness to suffer harm in order to protect someone else. The willingness to bear hardship in order to bless someone else. And we see the ultimate example of it in Jesus, John says in the 16th verse, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. It's the ultimate example, the ultimate picture of love. Now, Jesus did not lay down His life just to save you and me from a bee sting. Jesus laid down His life to protect me, to save me from the judgment that I so richly deserve for having disobeyed, for having pushed God to the edges of my life, for having tried to take His place. I mean, Jesus laid down His life. The Bible says, God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in that death, Jesus laid down His life to protect me and to protect you from the judgment that you and I so rightly deserve. That's the ultimate example of love. And the Bible says we ought to take our cue from that. And we do sometimes see people who, who love in this ultimate way. So here's a mom who gives up her life, who lays down her life for her child. Or here's a soldier who lays down his life, the ultimate expression of love for those who are in his unit to save their lives. But the problem with that is that you can only do it once. And so John doesn't stop there by giving us that picture of the ultimate expression of love. He says there's also an everyday kind of love. You see it in verse 17. He says, If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and yet closes his heart, against him. How does God's love abide in him? 
See those words that it closes his heart. Now everybody here, and probably everybody watching online, I would imagine, has either read or heard about the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember that story? The Bible says a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves and they stripped him and beat him, left him for dead. And when they did, their folks began to walk by on that road. And so a priest walked by on that road and the Bible says he passed by on the other side. And then a Levite comes along and he, same words, he passed by on the other side. We've got a ministry at the association, most of you know about it, called Good Samaritan. It provides for needy people, cares for folks who are struggling or without. And back before COVID, we used to have the opportunity to sit down face to face with everybody who came, hear their story and share the gospel story with them. And I would go down from time to time. And I would just listen to person after person. I always went down with the thought, well, I want to do somebody some good. And I always left with the same thought. I don't know if I did anybody else any good, but it sure did me a lot of good. Because it would remind me that there is an entire world of people who are struggling, people who have a, a, a life that is just tangled up, people who can't see the way to get out of the mess they've created sometimes for themselves. The Bible talks about that, but I forget about that. And I would go down and share the gospel, listen to story after story, and I would always come out so thankful. But the problems they described or the addictions they described or whatever issues they described, that those were not part of my life. It was as if we lived in different worlds. I always remember God bless me that I don't have to live in that world. But also, I always remember how easy it is for me to forget it exists. How easy it is for me just to walk by on the other side. Or to use the words in this text, how easy it is for me to close my heart. You ask me, what does love look like? It looks like generosity. The unwillingness to close my heart. The pain or difficulty that may not be a part of my life. It's very real in our community. Now John, when he talks about this more everyday version of love, what does it look like to love people? There's the ultimate picture. There's the common picture. In the common picture, he gives us an example of something that has to do with money, how we share with people, whether or not we're generous. But if he were here today, I don't think he would limit it to that. I think he would say, this has to do with anything that you and I have that we can provide to somebody else to ease their burden. So Sometimes it's about money, sometimes it's not. I think about your pastor, and I'm so thankful for him. Over this last month, as he sat out there in that parking lot, got out of his office, and it's just a way to say to everybody, all the 50,000 people who drive past this church every day, just a way to say to them, I'm available to you. Just a way to serve them. A way to say, whatever your hurts are, I want to hear them. I want to pray with you. That's what it looks like to love people. Sometimes what it looks like is just listening to them. You know, back early in the pandemic, every church trying to make decisions about how they're going to do their service and what protocols they would have or not have. And I'll just tell you, I'm not proud of this, but my first response to anybody asking me to wear a mask was just to get mad. I'm not proud of that, but it's true. It just made me mad. And at my church, when they would talk about it, I would get mad. I didn't say anything about it. I'm just talking about it inwardly. It just made me mad. 
And I was worried about whether or not they were listening to me. And I was worried about, are they respecting my rights? And I was worried about, you know, are, are they paying attention to what I have to say? Do I matter? And all these kind of things. And one day I was having a conversation with a lady in our church who's open age and very precious to me. At the time, our church had three services in the morning, and they were all the same. And she said to me, she said, you know, if our church would just have one service where folks would wear a mask, I could come back to church. And it hit me like a sledgehammer that I had been asking all the wrong questions. I had been asking, you know, are they respecting me? Are they listening to me? Am I being, you know, put in first in the line or whatever? And I should have been asking all along, how do I love my brother? How do I love my sister? Can you imagine what would happen in this country if God's people in the midst of a nation that is divided over race or divided over whatever the issue might be, if God's people were to stand up and instead of being a group of people who were primarily concerned with whether or not our rights are being respected, if our first question was just this simple thing, how can we love our brothers? Our sisters. It might revolutionize this country. It might revolutionize your workplace. It might revolutionize what happens around the dinner table at your house. That's what love looks like. It looks like generosity. It looks like serving. It looks like listening. And asking the right question, how do I love my brother? So what does it mean? When that's becoming a part of my life, and instead of just focusing on unforgiveness or focusing on whatever grudge I have or focusing on whether or not my rights are being respected or whatever else, I begin to focus on asking that question, how do I love my brother? Even in situations where they don't agree with me or in situations where they don't like me, or what I stand for. What does that signify? Because it's not normal. Not natural. You know, I love living in northeast Georgia. I love it. Not a place on this globe I'd rather be. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is that we get four seasons. So every year in, say, February, when they might be, it might be 25 degrees outside, might be snow on the ground, and these little yellow flowers poke their heads up out of the ground. I call them jonquils. You may call them daffodils. I know. Like I say, it may be cold as can be. It may be 25 degrees. But when those little yellow flowers start poking their heads up out of the ground, I know that we are migrating. We're not there yet. We may have a ways to go. It may be, may be still freezing cold next week, but I know we are migrating from winter into spring. Sometime this next week, I'll be sitting on my back porch or my front porch. We've got hardwoods all around our house, oak trees. So about this time of year, every year, you know, you'll hear it first just one, once in a while, it'll be like a rifle shot when one of those acorns falls 100 feet down and hits our roof. You know, it's like, Pow! couple of three weeks from now, it'll be like, pow, 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 pow. And wh when that starts to happen, it might be 95 degrees outside. I might be sweating up a storm. When that starts to happen, I know we're migrating from summer into fall. So John says that when you start to see in your life this tendency to ask the right question, how can I love my brother? That's not natural. It doesn't come from inside you. It's a signal of something. If you look, the Scripture says, verse 14, we know that we've passed out of death into life. That word, passed out of death, can be translated migrated. Just like those flowers tell me we're migrating from winter to spring. Just like those acorns tell me we're migrating from summer to fall. When you see this tendency to ask the right question, 
popping up in your life, it tells you that you've migrated. You're in the process of migrating from death to life. The Holy Spirit is at work in you. That's not coming from inside of you. It's coming from somewhere else. It's coming from what God is doing in your life. And it's an indication that you are a child of God. Verse 19, if you say, how do I know I'm saved? Now, there are a lot of ways. This is not a comprehensive message today on that subject, but you look in verse 19. John says, by this, and he means when you start asking the right question, how can I love my brother? He says, by this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. That's what it signifies. You're a child of God. And you may say, well, is that what saves me then? Does loving people, is that what saves me? Or keeping that commandment, is that what saves me? No. No more than those acorns hitting my roof are what makes fall come. That's not what makes fall come. It's just a good sign that fall is coming. And this is a good sign that the Holy Spirit's at work in your life. So, What do we do with all of this? What now? I'd say three things. And the first is that if you see these signs in your life, this tendency to ask the right question instead of the wrong one, this willingness to love people who may not love me or agree with me, may even hate me, thank God. Thank God that He is at work in your life. The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank God that the Holy Spirit of God is changing you. But on the other hand, if you, if you look in the mirror today, and you have to be honest and say, that's not a part of my life. Nothing close to that is part of my life. I'm not even willing for it to be a part of my life. If both of the things that John says are part of the family likeness for the children of God, meaning people who don't settle in a sinful lifestyle and people who love the people around them. If neither of those is part of your life, don't wave that off. Even if you're a church member, even if you walked an aisle one day, even if you were baptized someplace in some church, if these things are not a part of your life, if you are embracing a sinful lifestyle, if you do continue to hang on to resentment or hatred or bitterness constantly, that's your lifestyle. If that's who you are, then don't wave that off and don't, don't ignore it. Go to God and be like that guy in the Scriptures who said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Make sure that you are a child of God. Make sure... There's nothing in this world, no subject I could bring up this morning that matters more than that. Make sure. And if you're willing to pray that prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and ask God to save you. Let me say, the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. God is ready. His grace is available to you. Make sure. Lastly, if you're surrounded by discord, if you're surrounded by discord where you work, and many of us are, if you're surrounded by discord where you go to school or in your family, in your community, in your church community, if you're, if you're surrounded by discord and you're tempted like I am to dig in your heel, Focus on whether or not somebody is respecting your rights. One simple thing, start asking a different question. If you do it consciously at first, one day it will become automatic. But start asking a different question, and the question is, how can I love my brother? You and I do that. I don't know what it'll look like. It may not look like what it did for Pastor Brian where you will go sit in a parking lot for a month. But it may look like in your neighborhood somebody that you've had an argument with. 
you'll make up. It may look like somebody at work that disagrees with you. You'll listen to them. Say, let me pray for you. It may look like writing a letter to somebody you've been at odds with for a long time. It may look like any number of ways. It may look like cutting the grass for somebody who needs their grass cut. It may look like taking them a meal. It may look like who knows what. You may have to get out of the box like Pastor Brian did, but there's a way for you to ask that question and change that relationship. And when you do, God will open doors you can't imagine. He might just change our world.